so let's go back to the fourth chapter of the book of Mark. And then I, I want to go to uh, the fifth chapter of Mark. Now, <clears throat> we began <clears throat> with the truth that words are spiritual containers. Jesus said that in John 6, 63. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. They are life words. So say this, I am a believer. I am, a believer. I am not a doubter. My faith is strong. My, faith is strong. My, words, are healing words. My words are healing words. I rejoice, I rejoice at, the at the sound of the truth. And I walk in love. I walk by faith. I fight the good fight of faith. And it's a good fight because the victory is already won. My words are full of victory. I'm a victorious believer. I have a voice. My voice is the voice of victory. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Even my faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? The one who believes Jesus is the Christ raised from the dead. Shout it out. Glory to God. I have the victory. Ha. Huh. The sower sows the word. Now we began that Monday morning and, uh, and talked about what Jesus said. And the first thing he said, he said, hearken and behold. Listen. Why did he say that? I'm about to say something. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I used to tell the kids, I said, all right, are you listening? Uh-huh. <laughs> I said, get your catchers out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you listen to me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> As a family, we had a lot of fun. But now we had rules in our house that your mother and I are a solid front. So don't come in here telling me, well, well you know, mother said this. <laughs> if you're going to come on with that, we're going to go in there and talk to mother. Well, no, no. <laughs> we never did tell them. I'm going to spank you if you do that again. And they did it again. The spanking came. Well, I'll, yeah, but the next time you, well, no, it's all over. Amen. Our words had authority Amen. and love. I told John, just, just, just a little guy, and I could see right off that he liked knives well, he came by, honestly, I have a whole collection. I got a whole drawer full of knives I mean, and hunting knives and knives that people have given me and a whole set of Harley Davidson knives. And, and, and he just, just if, it had, if it was a knife, he wanted it. So now my words. And I had a drawer there in the kitchen and it had some knives in there. So I took him in there. I said, now, John, I'm going to tell you something about these knives. They'll hurt you. I said, don't play with them without me. Do you hear me? Uh-huh. I said, all right, tell me. Do you, you, you don't play with these without me. No, I know. Well, I went on in the other room. <laughs> And a little bit, ah! I went in there. 
and he picked up one of the little small knives and he, he got it open and he tried to close it and he closed it on his thumb. So his thumb was in there. And he's when I said, don't try to squeeze it. I said, you'll cut it more. Oh, he's just going. So I got hold of it, peeled it up there like that. And I, I cleaned it, cleaned the wound and, and covered it. It wasn't all that bad. And I put it on there. I said, uh, that kind of hurt, didn't it? Yes, sir, it did. <laughs> I said, do you happen to remember what I told you just a little while ago? <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I said, all right. Now, it was one of those little knives that, that uh, had one little knife on one side and one on this side. Little old blade about that long. I said, all right. I reached in there and picked it up and cleaned it off. I said, now look at this. You take this and when you open it, open it all the way like that. And you get ready to close it, hold it down here and take your hand and do this. And don't ever get do this. So when his thumb healed up, went in there and it got it. And I said, now you do it. Well, he looked at it a little bit. He didn't know whether he wanted to. I said, do it. It's not going to hurt you if you do it the right way. So he did it the right way. There was no reason in the world for me to jump all over him. I told you, bless God, not to do that. Now you'll learn not to do it. Well, he already learned not to do that. Yes, he did. Why? because God has never done me that way. Amen. Now there's something about my dad. He said, Kenneth, I told you not to do that. Yes, sir. You did it anyway. I said, yes, I did. Well, I'm going to spank you for it. And he's going about it. Well, when? I'm going to spank you for it. It's coming. Now, mother would go along. If she waited very long, she'd back out. <laughs> but she's an instant spanker. She'd grab a switch, just work me over good. <laughs> My dad said, I'm going to spank you for it. He might go on, on the road for a week and come back. I never knew when it was coming. I want you to know it was absolute torture. Because I mean, when he spanked, he didn't spank me but two or three times in my life, but oh, honey babe. <laughs> you know, the word says, spare the rod and spoil the child. Well, I was not spoiled. <laughs> I really was, but I hid it real well. <laughs> well, I mean, when the time come, he said, well, I told you, come on. And we either go out in the garage or go back in his bedroom and he'd shut the door. And, he, and, and he'd tell me, you know better. Now I'm your dad and I'm your friend. but I'm also the one that disciplines you. And I remembered it for <laughs> days. I'd go to school and sit down and say, what's the matter? Ain't none of your business. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I don't believe he should have done that. Well, I believe he should. Kelly's son, Max, was having some problems and he, he, he was upset with himself. And he, he, was, he was having, having some, he, didn't, he didn't like what he was doing. And he came home from school. Now, Kelly would use a wooden spoon. And he went and got the spoon and read the scripture and said, here. <laughs> and he didn't do it anymore. <laughs> 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, in this, we noticed that the Word does its part. Look at the 15th verse. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. When they have heard, Satan comes immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. They heard the word. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground. When they have heard, the word immediately receive it with gladness. The word was doing what it was supposed to do. It's what the people did or did not do that made the difference. It's how much they listened how much they retained what they heard. Then I talked to you about the fact that Gloria and I went to the Word to get out of debt. But we found more scriptures than Romans 13, 8. You can't do that. He wasn't even talking about money there. But that's what got our attention. So we let these words go down in us. And Gloria said, we're going to have to do soil sample here. We're going to have to be this hundredfold group. This hundredfold group. We have to be in order to do what the Lord's told us to do. I say, that's right, our day will come. <laughs> and it did. But now, just, just follow this all the way down. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust or pressures of other things. Look up the word lust. It is a drive and a crave to do things that are forbidden. I heard Oral Roberts say this. <coughs> a person came up to him and said, and, and I'm, I'm talking about a, a, a nice man now, He's not belligerent or anything, but he said, now, now God made me a homosexual. I didn't know how he was going to answer that. And Oral was just as kind he said, no, sir. God has never made anybody something he has forbidden. And you could see that it registered on his face and in his eyes. Amen. So, it, you, you, this, this, this is the way you have to look at sin. Now, if I had time, we would read the Ten Commandments. When, and just don't stop reading at the Ten Commandments. Keep reading because he begins to talk about the blessing. Amen. Amen. So, so here's the way the Lord read it to me. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. And he said, Kenneth, you don't need another god. I'm the best. Amen. He said, whatever second place is not going to make it, bud. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And he said, don't covet another the man's wife. He said, don't be doing that. He said, didn't I do you well? Yes. Amen. And I had no idea Glory Jean was even in the world. <laughs> ah, glory to God. Hallelujah. The blessings are involved. That's what those commandments are about. They're not do's and don'ts, they're blessings. Yes. That's the truth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Billy. <laughs> now, hang on. Okay, Lord. Um, thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's see, right? I, 
Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and snow from heaven and returns not there but waters the earth and makes it bring forth uh, bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Amen. It'll not return to me void. Well, how does it return? You take his word and pray it back at him. I was praying one day and I'm just really having a good time at it. And the word of the Lord came to me and he said, let the word fight its own fight. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> let the word fight its own fight. Amen. For you see, saith the Lord, my word is referred to as a sword, but it is a, a double-edged sword. It is sharp and sharp and sharp, and it'll cut and it'll do things. And it, the, if you put my word in your mouth and then you bring it back to me, then I'm obligated to listen. So come before me with my word in your mouth and plead your case. Amen. Plead your case. I want to hear it. I'll plead my case. Yeah. <laughs> Let my word do the fight. Amen. You just hold the handle of the sword. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, you suit up with the full armor of God, and then you find out it's prayer armor. <laughs> there was a woman I'd, I'd been praying for. She, I was ministering to her over the phone. <laughs> she said, well, now, Brother Copeland, I'm telling you, now, Mama is, Mama's sick. And, and I said, hey, now, wait, wait, well, wait a minute. What? I thought you had a covenant with God. I do. I said, you don't sound like it. Well, I do have a covenant with God. I said, well, what does it say? Uh, well, 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 I'll tell you what it says. And she just started coming at me with that. She said, and the, 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 more, the louder she got, the more excited she got. And I'll tell you, bless God, I have a covenant. God, I'm going to go tell her to just get up and get well. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it went on along there for several days. She called me back. Brother Copeland, I said, now just hold it. I thought you told me you had a covenant. Yeah, I do have a covenant. Here she came again. Amen. <laughs> well, it didn't take all that long till it stuck. Amen. Now there's another woman that I had ministered to her and she was healed of cancer. Well, it came back on her, so she called me. And, and I said, all right, now I'll tell you what. Now I want you to get your Bible and read, read this together. And I could hear her. She held her hand. She asked somebody, else, where's my Bible? So I just sat there on the phone a little bit. I said, did you find it? Uh, I said, you already know what's the matter. You have put your Bible down. I said, that cancer's working 24 hours a day and the Word isn't. 10% Word, 10% results. Let the Word fight its own fight. These words are spiritual containers. I dare say your faith is higher tonight than it's been in your life. Mine is. I needed this meeting. Glory to God. I mean, 
you know, and as you notice, I mean, we had direct uh, into the rooms and, and I, I just go back to my room and just get in on all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Now, one year, the, the year that we sold that first little house in Steamboat Springs, we had a gold wing up there that was in a storage uh, place. And after Southwest, I went up there to get it. Well, now back there then, if I was not in the meetings, there was no way to hear. So I just get the tapes and listen to it later. Well, I was tired and it was hot. (laughs) In August, I mean, it's just over. So I told Gloria, uh, I said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Steamboat and get that motorcycle. So the guys flew me up there and, and I went over and, and got it. Well, and I had the trailer and I had all that hooked up. Well, on front of that trailer, I had a cooler. So I filled it full of ice and water. Now, the first night, I stayed on the mountainside of it as long as I could and got down to Trinidad. And then I left there and went to Clayton, New Mexico. And I got up Clayton, New Mexico at 4.20 in the morning to get through Amarillo before it's hot. <laughs> I'm listening to those tapes. That, that gold wing had a tape player in the side of it, cassette deck. So I'm listening to everybody's tapes. Man. And it, the, I mean, the further south I got, the hotter it got. <laughs> I rode into Wichita Falls and uh, went in and had lunch, came out and turned my bike on, turned the temperature gauge on. She's 105. Well, you've been here. You know what it's like in Texas this time of year. People gripe about it, but it's supposed to do that. There are years that are better than others. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So I put on a stretch belt. Now, words are containers now, you see. I was tired. And back there in those days, you know, I, I, didn't, have, I didn't take a, a day off doing that. I just preached all the way through. <clears throat> and I'd take a stretch belt and I'd stick that bottle of water down in there. And I put my towel in that ice water and pull it up around behind my neck and put another tape in. Well, I got home about four o'clock that afternoon, drove in the driveway. I walked out there and Gloria thought I'd just be just bush to have, you know, ride two full days like that straight through. I mean, just stop and eat and everything. And I got off that bike and I said, Gloria, Jean, I want you to know, bless God, if I had time, I'd go back. She said, what happened? I said, I listened to 15 tapes. That's what happened. I got home in better shape than when I left. Whoa, man, I'm hearing all this faith. I was, yeah, glory. I needed it. I poured my faith out in that meeting. I needed to hear it. And I listened this time. I sat there and laughed at Jeremy and Keith and and Jesse, I, you know, what did Jesse say? Tell me what he said. You don't even know. <laughs> the whole thing is so exciting. You know what's exciting about it? You. You. Hungry people. That's what makes it powerful. And that's what makes it good. Now, let's go back over there once more. Where we were in Mark 4. Now, continue with it. Look, look here in 21. He said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed? What good is a candle under a bed? It's worthless. May set the bed on fire, but the <laughs> glory's little brother, Stanley. <laughs> we were there at, at Pop's house and we smelled smoke. And, uh, and the mattress was on fire up underneath the bed. 
Stanley, I mean, that's the first thing. Stanley, come in here. He came in there. He said, did you set that bed on fire? No. <laughs> you sure? Uh -huh. He said, who did? He said, a rabbit did it. <laughs> Charles Capps said there's a little boy in Sunday school. And the teacher said, what is a lie? He said, it's an abomination to God and ever-present help in the time of need. <laughs> then she's teaching on, and she said, Lot's wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. And he spoke up and said, that ain't nothing. My mother looked back and turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> <laughs> well, what'd that have to do with this lesson? Absolutely nothing, but I... <laughs> But you can tell this is about the end of the day. <laughs> now notice, there is nothing hidden which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Now what does that mean? You can't hide it. Neither can I. Oh, I was having trouble with the TV bill. And, and so, hold your place there and let's go back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1. <clears throat> 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Well, that's good news, isn't it? Though they be red like crimson, they'll be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And, uh, <clears throat> and I went before, I took, it, I took that very scripture before him. I said, now, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And we're behind on these television bills. And he said, well, you said that. He said, you don't qualify for that. I don't. No. He said, you haven't had anything good to say about daily television ever since I told you to do it in, in the beginning. Well, he's right. So he took me over to the curse and he changed my life forever. Now, and I was reading this and when he didn't write at that moment, I accepted his correction. By then, I, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to change. I'm, I'm willing. Oh, oh, all these curses will come on you and pursue you and overtake you till you be destroyed because you serve not the Lord God with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. I'm telling you, I'm changed. So now I went to Exodus 23. I wanted to do this this morning, but it, <clears throat> this is misquoted. Verse 25, you shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless your bread and water and I'll take sickness away from the midst of you. Nothing shall be cast before the young or barren in the day of the land, the number of your days I'll fulfill. Glory to God. That's not what that says. You know why? Because you started there. Go back to the 20th verse. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way to bring you into the place where I have prepared. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he, your angel, shall bless your bread and water. I will take sickness from the midst of you. Just a little adjustment. So I started, I started writing that in. You shall serve, I said there, you shall serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. I wrote it there in my Bible. 
and I got happy. So I, I just started saying, I said, thank you, Lord Jesus. I love daily television. I mean, I love it. Hallelujah. Oh, let me get in on that daily television. Yes, glory be to God. I love it. Hallelujah. Couldn't wait for the next one. So, I, and I was in there by myself. So I don't know, some of you may remember it. I was by myself. And so used to, I wouldn't smile till they turned on the camera. I was tired. I didn't want to do it in the first place. And I told God I didn't want to do it, but I'd do it anyway. And I was, I was so tired and exhausted, but that was my fault. And I sat in there and I looked in that camera one day and I said, I quit. I didn't intend to come back. Gloria Jean said, I'll do it. Now, what you don't know about her, she was so shy and so timid. We were in a church one time. I was preaching there, and the pastor said, Sister Gloria, uh, when we get out, you can just stand and, and greet the people. She said, I don't do that. She meant it. So she was sitting down there with the pastor's wife and he introduced me and he said, Sister Gloria, would you stand and greet the people? She stood up and said, I told you I don't do that. And then she felt like a dog. <laughs> and later she had to apologize. She just didn't do that. And we would have, of course, all my flying buddies would come over and we'd all talk. She'd sit there all night and never say anything. I said, sweetheart, how come you know? She said, why, you talk enough for both of us. But, and I did. She didn't like to do that. Now, she was born the 12th of February, 1942. Her dad was overseas, 1st Infantry Division. Now, he was on ship, the Big Red One. He was on ship headed to Italy. He had an abscessed tooth. They took him off. The, the first infantry division liked it got wiped out. So then he was, he would, when he got this tooth fixed, they put him back aboard ship and he shipped out to England. He trained there in England made it all the way through Normandy, made it all the way through and through the Battle of the Bulls. Now, Olin Creech was in the 1st Infantry Division. He may have known Wallace Neese, Babe Neese. He went all the way through all of that before he got home. He saw things people ought not see. He got home and he had PTSD, something terrible. And he would just go along fine and, and he'd get the best of him. And, and he'd start drinking and just kind of ch chill out. And, and he'd, be, he'd be just out for several days and get up and take care of his job. Well, nobody knew anything about that back there then. Had I known that, I ministered to him anyway. Great guy. I love him so. Well, now, he and Mary divorced. It just got to where it, she just, well, she couldn't stay there. But he remarried. And he married a woman that went to the First Baptist Church in Nashville, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Well, at first he wouldn't go. Wasn't a bit shame. Ah, uh, but then he had this big bad heart attack. Uh, like to died. Did a bypass. Well, of course, Gloria and I went to Texarkana. I met the, first, the pastor of the First Baptist Church. Amen. And he stayed with him night and day. He stayed with him in that room. He stayed there with him and prayed with him and laid hands on him. And, and he stayed up. And, and then he said, and he, and he said, and then when I got his attention, he said, I led him to Jesus Christ and prayed the prayer of faith with him. He never took another drink. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
finished up his time, delivered from that war. God is a faithful God. He's a faithful God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. His words changed. He was ministered to by, by a pastor that loved him. Ah, Lord my God. Hallelujah. So now, let's go now to the 26th verse. He said, so is the kingdom of God. So this is the way it is. This is the way the kingdom of God is. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. He's already said the sower sows the word. So he's talking about the words of God. He's talking about his own words here. So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. Now you put in that offering, you've been sowing in offerings all week long, a lot of it. And those of you that have been online and 36609 and so forth, just like I did. But now, 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 you, now you got the seed in the ground. It's in there. Don't forget about it. Should sleep and rise night and day, the seed should spring and grow up. He knows not how. He doesn't need to know. He doesn't need to be a biologist <laughs> for a seed to grow. Now, Rachel, my granddaughter, Kelly's daughter, oldest, and uh, she and Caleb and the, and the kids live just right there close to us. Well, uh, we, were, we were having, uh, you know, it was Halloween for everybody else, but it, we have hallelujah parties. And they were making a hallelujah uh, jack-o'-lantern pumpkin, and it was a smiley face one. And you, you know, he had to, she had a, some big old pumpkins. And so she hollowed them all out and cooked. And then, you know, you stick it where you stick a little candle down on the inside. And the kids thought that was just about the coolest thing they ever saw in their life. <laughs> and so they just went on. She's forgot about it. They were out in the backyard on the picnic table. All of a sudden, some started growing under that table. It was a pumpkin vine. <laughs> well, of course it was. That, that seed knew what to do. Just give me some ground. I'm going to make a pumpkin. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, World War II, we lived in Abilene, and, and, the, and the, the ground there just really grew nearly anything. We had victory gardens. And they did this in the big cities. New York City, Chicago, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, people that lived in the cities and had planters. They got rid of the flowers and everything and, and they grow vegetables because the produce was going into the service. Amen. Well, we had a victory garden in our backyard. I'm like a rabbit where carrots are concerned. Gosh. And well, that, and you go, the government, in some cases, they'd give you the seed. And if you had to buy it, it just was a little nothing. But they were promoting these victory gardens and people were doing that all over the United States. And you had a little package and it had a little stick. And it had a picture of what that seed is. Yes. Well, now before, if you got your flower, your flower seeds, they were that way. But you weren't getting that anymore. You're going to have carrots and and whatever else in your victory garden. Well, my mother's raised on a farm, and so was my dad. And we had a victory garden out there in our backyard. Oh, it was nice. And mother would say, let the carrots alone until they get <laughs> and, and then when it came time to pull them, 
Well, I'd, they'd get ready and pull those big old carrots out of the ground. And I'd just go over there and stick it under the hydrant, just get it, dirt and all. Just to see, say, Kenneth, what? And I said, no, no. <laughs> I'm still that way about carrots. <laughs> Amen. So, what? That seed knew what to do. So, we had watermelon one day. My dad and I, I mean, to get to travel with him was, uh, I was his disciple. He disciplined me. And later, I became his disciple, and he's my hero. And with it, they'd be selling watermelon on a truck out there somewhere. He'd just stop and get one, go get under a bridge somewhere. He'd clean his pocket knife off, and here we go after that watermelon. <laughs> So we had watermelon there one day. Well, I planted the seeds. And I'd start to leave them, and that little vine started coming up. It was right out there behind the back door. And, and that, that little vine started coming up. And finally, I looked under there, and I got a watermelon about this big. And then it got a little bigger than that, and got a little bigger than that. And every, time, every day I'd come home from school, I'd, I'd raise that vine up and check. Well, I came home from school one day and I raised up that vine. There's watermelon under there about that big. I thought, we've had a miracle here. <laughs> yes. I said, look at this. And, and my daddy got so excited about it. Man, he cut the stem on that thing and we brought it out there and got on the table and cut it open. I said, there's something wrong here. He said, what's wrong, Kenna? I said, this is red. He said, what's wrong with that? I said, those seeds were yellow. <laughs> I said, you did that, didn't you? He said, yes, I did. <laughs> you can't fool that seed. See, that seed knew exactly what to do and so did the ground. Amen. What did I do? Went to bed and got up, went to bed and got up, went to bed and got up. It grew. I didn't know how. I didn't know God. Didn't care. Whether I, but I knew it would. This is the point. I knew that it would. I knew that it would. At least I was that smart. I knew that it would work. My grandfather's a farmer and a good one. Good one. I was just a kid and it's hot. Most of the work is at harvest time, but that's when it's fun. It's when you're preparing. The, boy, and the ground is so hot. And I was out there in the middle and the first we were doing is you take a, a field hole that has a little bit longer handle. And, and my grandfather, it didn't, have, it didn't have a deep end on it like this. It had like this and sharpen it where you could just scoop that thing under, the, under stickers and weeds and just slice them off at the ground. But hot and my, my, my boots get so hot, I'd curl my toes up. And so, and there, there was a, there was a Hispanic guy that, that lived close by there and he'd worked for my grandfather from time to time and he was out there. <laughs> and we're going down those rows and I mean, listen, big farm. And you, you know, you, if you're walking down this way, you're walking there and just swinging that hole like that. Well, he's walking and I mean, he's going. He's just going like this. And just, I mean, it doesn't miss a weed. Well, and, and, and the Spanish guy and me, I mean, we're cutting and slinging as fast as we can. And all of a sudden, here come my grandfather going this way, and we hadn't got down to the end of the road. And he said, when does that old man fall down? <laughs> I said, he doesn't. That's the problem with this thing. I said, Papa, how come you're so much faster than I am? How come you can do such a better job than this? He looked at me. He said, you don't set your jaw. Oh, what does that mean? I didn't mean it. I was just out there because my mama told me to go out there. He was out there because he was in business. He set his jaw. He didn't have anything on his mind but getting every last weed out of that place because he's about to come by, back by through there with either a cotton crop or wheat. 
and he had three sections of land, and one section is 640 acres. He was a busy man, but his rows, I mean, they looked like somebody put a rule on them. He said, you can tell a man's character by the way his rows look. He said, they all like this. He don't care. <laughs> But I learned later he's right. And I learned to set my jaw. Amen. Amen. When I found out what I was called to do, and I did it with all my heart. I realized I had my jaw set. And I remember him. Now, we go in this. The Word is the power because it's the Word of the living God. Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or how we compare it? Like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it's thrown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under it. And many such parables spake he, now wait, now listen to it. Many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. You notice, notice how many times here was in this. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. All things. I mean, he taught them on this. He, he evidently, he got them by themselves, got out of that crowd. I mean, he must have gone over this a whole lot. I think, now you don't hear me say I think a lot, but I'm convinced that that's when he taught them about agreement prayer. Because over in the book of Matthew, he said, again, I say unto you, if any two of you on earth shall agree. Well, when he's expounding all things, so those are the times when he got into those things. Now, now here's what I want you to see out of this, and here's what the Lord wants you to see. The same day, say the same day. Amen. When evening was come, he said to them, let's pass over unto the other side. And when they sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so now it's full. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. He's been teaching all day. They woke him up and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? They feared exceedingly and said to one another, What manner of man is this? Even the wind and the sea, sea will be. I'll tell you what was the matter with them. They quit listening. He expounded the whole thing. He went to sleep expecting them to take him home. And the devil stirred up a big wind out there and they got scared. Instead of taking what he taught and saying, he gave us the command to go to the other side. Now we are going, and in the night, I'm not going to wake him up. In his name, I'm telling you, storm to get out of here. It would have ceased for them the same as him, but they were not listening well enough to keep it. The devil stole it after. And there you have the bottom line of that. Now, let's go to the fifth chapter. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, here. We just found out they came over unto the other side of the sea and in the country of the Gadarenes. Now, if you, if you look at the Galilee, Capernaum is over here. 
Magdal is down here. And, and the Gadarenes is over here on this side of the lake in this, this part. It's over across the lake from Capernaum. So now, they came out of the ship immediately. They met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, we won't turn there. But in, in fact, we could put it up, the sixth chapter of Ephesians, please, and start with the 10th verse. Thank you, Jesus. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Rulers of the darkness of this world are the ones that possess people. One devil. Now, and I've, I've had considerable experience at this. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had often been bound with fetters or shackles and chains, the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. Well, he had an unclean spirit. He was possessed with this thing. Always, night and day, he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. He was a cutter and he didn't sleep. Night and day. So you could imagine what kind of condition he was in. He's naked. Well, that devil is in him, controlling him. Now, everybody heard this. Everybody that was there heard this. Well, if there wasn't anybody there but his men, they heard every bit of this. They were right there with him. So now, notice this. He had an unclean spirit, one. So he was an unclean man. Living among those tombs, no man could bind him. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him. Now, if there had been anybody that the devil could have stopped from worshiping, it would have been him because he completely controlled him. Come on. But he worshiped him. He couldn't stop him from worshiping him. And I will point out that Jesus delivered him just like that. Amen. 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 So now notice this. And, and I'm going to attempt to do this. You, it's, it, it's hard to imitate this, but I've had devils to talk to me more than once. And cried with a loud voice, What am I? to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God. I adjure you by God, you torment me not. For Jesus had already said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is your name? He answered and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. My name is Legion, for we are many. So there's three to 6,000 devils involved in this thing. I have no earthly idea how he first yielded to it. I don't know. But now he's, it's completely done in him. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of that country. They were there on assignment. Now, there were 2,000 hogs or more 
they were food for the Roman army. There sure weren't any Jews having anything to do with them. <laughs> but that's what frightened the people there. Mm, mm, mm. So now, now there were nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and then all the devils. Now the people didn't hear this, but Jesus did. They didn't hear this. Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Forthwith, Jesus gave them leave. The unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they were drowned, about 2,000 of them. All spirit beings desire a body. Those devils lost their bodies. Fallen spirits. They're fallen devils. I wish I had time to go into all that, but I don't. But every spirit desires a physical body through which they have a wide range of expression. The Holy Spirit needed your and my body Amen. to have a wider range of expression. Okay. Amen. Amen. I had the Lord say to me one time, this is Memphis, Tennessee. And the uh, first meeting I was on with Brother Roberts, this was the second time my feet stuck to the ground. I walked in there and there's over 2,000 sick people in there and I could smell it. It frightened me so, I just walked out the exit door <laughs> in that big auditorium in Memphis. And I got out the door and my feet stuck to the sidewalk. And I said, all right, what is it? He said, on here inside here, he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. I said, I'm going back to Tulsa. How are you going to get there? I said, I don't know. I'm going to catch a Greyhound bus or something. They can get that airplane home any way they want to. Why? I said, I, I, I can't stand that. Mm. He said, inside me, he said, Kenneth, I could have filled you with an angel. I was standing right out there on that sidewalk. I'm talking out loud. I'm just glad there wasn't anybody walking along there. <laughs> I said, you could what? He said, well, what do you think a demon-possessed man is? Full of a fallen angel, the devil himself. I said, my feet are still stuck now. Because in a minute, he's going to give me my choice. He said, I didn't fill you with an angel. I wouldn't trust you to an angel. I filled you with myself, and I have anointed you to do something about this. Now, what are you going to do? And my feet came unstuck. And I said, praise God, I'm going back in there. <laughs> and I found out right then, that's why I'd been baptized in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Up to then, I knew I was speaking a lot of tongues real hard and fast, but I didn't know, I mean, you know what, what, I mean, what's it all about? It's great, you know, and all that. But now I found out why. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, now, this is happening to this man. Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they were about 2,000 and they drowned. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city, and in the country they went out to see what was done. They come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Where did they get the clothes? Faith prepares. He knew what he was going to do, and he knew he's going to call this man to preach. 
He's clothed and in his right mind. And they began to pray him to get out of here. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. How be it Jesus suffered him not, but said, Go home to your friends and tell them how great things the, the Lord hath done and has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Now check it out. Check it out. The next time Jesus came through the Decapolis, the crowd was there. It just didn't give us his name. So, here's what must have happened. Jesus must have said, Terry, he must have said, now look, before we go over there, I want to warn you about something. There's a man over there and he's completely com possessed with the devil and he's going to be nasty looking. He's going to be running around out there naked and he's a cutter. He, he's going to be bleeding. Looks terrible, nasty. But my father has directed me to go over there and deliver him of that devil because my father wants to call him to preach. So Judas, come up with some money here. Go buy some nice clothes. Now, I don't want him going home naked. No. The man's going to be a preacher. He needs to look good. He needs to go home looking good. And they're going to say, where in the world are you being? Well, let me tell you. So then he would have gone all the way back and told his story then of how it got started. Now, I was in Jamaica, and uh, we were headed to church one night, and the man that was driving for me, he said, he said, Brother Copeland, he said, before, before we, go, before we go, go, go preach in New Hope, he said, can we stop by and pray, and pray for a woman? I said, sure. And he started to get in the car, and he said, oh, yeah, she's mad. I said, why? She said, she's crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I had a former Marine with me, and he was helping me in, in a lot of different ways. Well, there was Earl and the pastor and me. So we went into this house, no electricity, just you know, oil lamps. We were up in the mountains. That's what the Lord directed me to do. And uh, got up there and walked into this house and we walked in there. It looked like, it looked like some kind of Halloween thing. It was spooky. I mean, we went through a couple of rooms and it looked like to me anybody in there could have qualified. I mean, it was a bad looking place. And they kind of laughing at me as I walked by. And some of them, I was the first light-skinned man they'd ever seen in the first place. I'm up in the hills, walked all the way back, and there was a young woman up in the middle of a bed. No, no just, just no cotton mattress. Just squatted on a haunches there. No kerosene lantern hanging on the wall or light, you know, globe over it. And it wasn't a lantern, but it was a wall light. So it's kind of dim in there in the first place. I walked up there, and, and she was just like this. If, if, if that's me standing there, she was about like this. And when we walked in there, she turned around and she ducked down like this. She looked over there at that pastor, and he said, you must be Oral Roberts. He said, no, ma'am. Looked over there at Earl and said, you must be Brother Weber. Well, Brother Weber was a, a, a radio teacher and a good one. He said, no, ma'am. I know who you are. 
and you're afraid of anything that isn't flesh and blood. I looked at, and he went down. I said, now look at me, baby. Look at, look at me. I, I said, I fear neither man nor beast. Look at me. Now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose I am and whom I serve, you let her go. You come out of her right now. And she ducked her head. And I said, no, now listen to me. The Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus sent me here to tell you that he loves you. She took me and I said, look, 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 look at me. She looked up there at me. I said, the Lord sent me here to tell you that he loves you. Well, I didn't have time to hang around. She just looked at me. You could see it in her eyes. That spirit was gone. Well, we got in the car. And I asked the pastor, I said, do you know this family? Oh, yeah. He said, I've, I've known, I've known. The whole. I said, what happened to her? Well, Brother Kenneth, he said, she was 18 years old and she was, she was a waitress and there was a group came to town and preaching and she got saved and she was so thrilled. So she bought her a new dress and she went and had her hair fixed and, and cleaned up and, you know, and, you know, powdered up and everything and went to church. And she walked up on the front door of the church and they said, you can't come in here. Why? You have cut your hair. Look, what's that on your fingernails? Jesus does not love women that cut their hair, paint their face and paint their fingernails. They wouldn't let her in the church. Well, she didn't know anything. And, and she, she tried her best to keep working, but she got that on her mind and she couldn't get it off, didn't know how to get it off. And nobody up there in those hills could tell her anything. Well, the pastor really didn't know how to handle it. And she dwelt on it and dwelt on it and dwelt on it and dwelt on it until that devil took over her mind. He didn't take over her spirit. She's born again. I didn't know. I kept telling her that Jesus sent me to tell her he loved her. And that's what snapped it and that thing left. Hallelujah. This is what this is all about. Well, now, this is the very beginning. Well, I was living there. The glory and I was living in that, that little place there in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. Well, our house faced this way, and there were houses facing this way. And then across the back alley, there were another house. And so our good friends lived in one of those houses there, and he was going to um, Trinity Bible College there in Tulsa. <laughs> Charles Duncombe started that school. And he had Smith Wigglesworth preach in his church. Oh, and he told a story. I wish I had time to tell you. But anyway, <laughs> oh Lord. Well, let me back up. Something that happened before that. I was preaching. I was just singing. Had a meeting with Charles Rogers. Oh, what a man of God. Well, he was, he was doing the preaching. I was just there to sing. And I was having a great time. Well, this woman said, Brother Roger, Rogers, would you go to the hospital with me? She said, my mother's about to die, and I don't know whether she's saved or not. Would you come? He said, well, sure. So he said, come on, you can go. So I just went. Well, got there. <laughs> Well, I stopped down here at the foot of the bed because I don't know anything about this. And this little old woman is laying there like this. She looked like she's about 75. Mouth kind of hung open. Well, Charles and the girl were up there talking together. <laughs> and while they're talking, this little bitty woman raised straight up in the bed and said, sick boy, sick, sick boy, sick. Scared me. I'm telling you, I ran out that hospital door. I was standing out there in that hall and I said, oh Lord. 
<laughs> what on earth was that? Oh, and then I was so ashamed of myself. Back in those days, I weighed about 220. And I said, look at my big, ugly self. That devil run me out of the room. And I guarantee you there'll never be another to run me out. <laughs> well, and so the day we left to go to Tulsa, the Lord said, you get that fat off of you today. <laughs> well, I trimmed down considerably by this time. So... <laughs> John called me. He said, can you come over here and help me? He said, there's a young man that's staying in my house. And he said, I think he's got a devil in him. He said, I can't get him to leave. <laughs> so I went over there. I said, what's the matter here? He said, well, he gave his testimony at the Full Gospel Venice Men's Fellowship. And he was a tail gunner on a B-25 in World War II. And everybody was killed but him. I said, is that what he told over there? Yeah. Did they believe it? Well, yeah, he came to stay home. I said, he wasn't even born in World War II. I mean, come on. <laughs> really? I, he don't know what a B-25 is. I said, yeah, I'll come over. <laughs> so I walked into John's kitchen. And there the guy sat there in that kitchen, at the kitchen table. Well, the, the table was just a little dinette table, you know chair here and a chair here. He was sitting here. So I came over here and said, I'm talking to him. Now there's a hall, a door right there going into the hall. It was just like our house. And you turned that way for one bedroom and that way for another bedroom. Well, John, I don't know where Joanne was, but he was standing there in the hall. So I sat there and looking at him across that table. I could see it in his eyes. And uh, I gave him some scripture and he wouldn't answer me, wouldn't say anything. Just, his eyes were just dead. And I did my best with scripture, so he just wouldn't, wouldn't respond at all. So I said, well, I'm going to pray for you. And I stood up and I got him to stand up and turned him around here this way in the name of Jesus, and I put my hand on his head, and he hit me in the face. Mm -mm. I just reacted. I didn't think. I unloaded on him. I hit him so hard, it knocked him back through that hall and stuck his rear end through the sheetrock wall, and he's hanging out that hole like this. I caught him like this, pulled him out of that hole, and set him down and sat down on him and started casting devils out of him. And by the time I got through with him, he was all right. Now, I do not recommend that. that kind of, but anyway, I mean, that, that's just the way it happened. And, he, and so John was running around that ring in his hand. He said, what's the landlord going to say about this hole in my wall? He didn't care enough about that. <laughs> don't do that. You know how you keep from doing that? You don't touch him. You get eye contact That's right. and don't lose it. That's right. There was a young woman. This, I, I remember this as being in England. I, I believe it was. Anyway, she came up there in front of me, just really nice looking, and said she had some, some problems, wanted deliverance from him. I said, all right. So, you know, we began to pray. I didn't detect any problems. And so I laid hands on her and she spit in my face. I mean, just spit. And I started laughing. And I started laughing and I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. She's standing there looking at me like this. Just, I mean, the devil all over. And I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. I said, come get her and take her back there in that room and get the devil out of her. And they did. And she came out she was just happy. And I just had spit running down all over my face. <laughs> Don't ever be afraid of them. That's 
Not ever. Not ever. But you listen in here. Amen. Amen. What do you think? You get anything out of this tonight? Faith works. Amen. And the, the basic fundamentals of faith. Brother Hagin would say it over and over and over and over again. Now, now be careful because you'll start where you are and then you'll have new people come in and they don't have any idea what you're talking about. Right. He said from time to time, I mean, go to the, to the fundamentals of faith, the basic fundamentals. The a, he'd call it the ABCs of faith. Amen. So you go back to the woman with the issue of blood and you start over again. Now, this is the way faith works. Amen. Number one, <laughs> faith is a product of the spirit, not the mind. That's right. That's right. It's born out of and in the born again human spirit. Amen. We were in a seminar one Sunday afternoon and Brother Hagin finished up his, what he was saying and got over there in, in, in Thess Thessalonians and he said, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body. I turned to Gloria. I said, that is the key right there. That is it. The soul and the spirit are not the same thing. Yes. And you go to the book of Hebrews and it says it again, yes. dividing the soul and the spirit with the word. That's it. We are spirit beings and our words are filled with either faith or something else. And I'll say it to you again. Let me get up there so I can quit. I'll say it to you again while you stand up. In fact, you can say it with me and say it boldly. Faith-filled words, faith words dominate, dominate the, laws the laws of sin and death. Sin and death. I'm, a I'm a believer. I am a spirit being like God. I, am a being like God. I speak, I speak like, God. like God. I speak His word, speak his word. And, his words and His words become my words and then my Father God and me are one. We are one together. We are one spirit together. I love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all my strength. I love my neighbor as myself, fulfilling all the law and the prophets. And Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another and all people will know you're my disciples the way you love one another. So rejoice and be glad for I have developed a way to see to it, to see to it that, you're well all that you're always well all the time. 